Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Galicia Jewish Museum in its online version. Uh, this is a third, third meeting from a series of meetings that are part of a, a, a bigger program. And this program is uh, co-financed by the Minister of Culture and, and uh, by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Poland uh, through the competition Public Diplomacy 2020. Um, the main component of this uh, of this program is a mobile application that the, the Galicia Jewish Museum launched in September. Uh, I encourage you to try to find this uh, in your App Store. It's free to download both in Android App Store and, and uh, iOS, uh, Apple App Store. Um, and the, the application basically showing every few days one selected photograph connected with the Jewish history in Poland from the mid 19th century all the way to the contemporary projects. And each and every photograph is accompanied by a short um, short text. Um, we designed this application as a tool of learning um, small bits about Jewish um, Jewish Poland, and when combined, these bits will give you, we hope, a, 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 a bigger, bigger picture of Polish Jewish history. Today's event um, is connected with this app because it's uh, it will be a conversation about Jewish life in Poland after 1989. So after the democratic revolution in Poland, actually democratic revolution in um, entire Eastern and Central uh, or Central. Europe. We have a uh, we have special guests with us to, uh, to tonight today, um, Monika Krajewska and Professor Stanisław Krajewski, and they will be properly introduced by uh, Edita Gavron, Dr. Edita Gavron, who is uh, who is leading this conversation. Thank you, Edita, for agreeing for uh, to, to join us and for um, being here with us. Uh, Edita, as some of you know, is a, an excellent scholar, historian assistant professor at the Jagiellonian University in the Department of Jewish Study. Mm. She's also president of the board of the Galicia Jewish Heritage Institute, which is an entity uh, running a Galicia Jewish Museum of which I am a deputy, uh, deputy uh, director. She's, she sits on the, on the other boards, on the boards of the JCC Krakow, and she's specializing with the Jewish history uh, in the 20th century, so she's the best, possibly the best person to uh, to lead this um, this conversation. Before I will uh, ask Edita to, to to start this this um, this event, uh, one or actually two technical uh, technical uh, things. One, uh, there is a chat option. You can ask questions. If you have questions to our panelists, uh, you can ask them, and we will try to answer some of them. Uh, we will probably run out of time as usually, but we will at least try to answer some of those uh, question. And second thing is that uh, at the end of the uh, of this meeting, there will be like one minute, two minutes survey uh, appearing on your screen. So if you will be uh, um, kindly, um, if you can kindly uh, fill this form, it will be very helpful with the other uh, events that we are um, planning to uh, to have. This is recorded. It will be available later online uh, via museum website, Facebook, and uh, YouTube channel. Edita, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Tomek. Uh, thank you for uh, starting the meeting today for the introduction and uh, most of all for inviting uh, us to, to join the project and to uh, cooperate uh, within the framework of uh, um, a series of meetings, um, um, in a sense, promoting the application, but also adding to the application and uh, its con uh, content. So uh, I'm very um, privileged to, to uh, moderate the meeting today. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to uh, have two excellent speakers, uh, wonderful people uh, in uh, this conversation, uh, Monika and uh, Stanisław uh, um, uh, are with us today. And uh, just let me introduce uh, briefly uh, uh, our guests today. Um, some of you, some of you in the audience uh, know uh, them already. Uh, and uh, some of you have uh, read the bios, but I think it's never enough to say a few words about uh, the guests. 
So let me start with uh, Monica, who um, is, uh, as uh, she describes her, uh, Polish Jewish artists. Uh, uh, and this component of Polish Jewish is uh, quite important. Polish Jewish artists, writer, uh, photographer, uh, and educator. And uh, uh, her photographs uh, uh, showing Jewish cemeteries uh, in Poland uh, and tombstone art uh, were published very early for such kind of publications uh, in or early 1980s. Uh, the Time of Stones was translated to uh, several languages. Um, the, another book, A Tribe of Stones, uh, published uh, a, a decade later, was uh, also very uh, um, well um, received. Uh, and Tomek is presenting uh, the second book um, right now. Uh, so thank you for that, um, Tomek. As uh, an artist, uh, Monica specializes in Jewish paper cats. Uh, that uh, include uh, also uh, Hebrew calligraphy uh, and several elements. And some of you could have uh, could see the, the paper cats uh, as part of the apartment's decoration as presented a few minutes ago. Uh, but of course, uh, there are more works available um, in publications and in the galleries uh, in Poland and abroad. Uh, Monika also gives lectures and workshops on a Jewish uh, tradition, and this uh, tradition is presented through art, uh, through artistic activities. So that's um, an amazing experience to attend uh, such uh, events run by Monika. Of course, I took uh, I could uh, talk more uh, about uh, Monika, but let me uh, move to um, uh, uh, Stanisław. Stasia, if my, I may, um, Krajewski, um, Professor Stanisław Krajewski, uh, a Polish uh, Jewish philosopher, professor of, uh, at the Faculty of uh, Philosophy uh, at the University of Warsaw. Um, um, Stasia uh, co-founded the uh, Polish uh, Council of Christians and Jews and uh, uh, he has been the uh, Jewish co-president uh, uh, of it uh, since its establishment and uh, uh, he's involved in the Christian Jewish dialogue in all forms uh, for many years. And uh, he has been also a member of uh, uh, many initiatives and projects, but I would like to mention, especially in the presence of uh, uh, Professor Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet, who is in the audience. Greetings, Barbara. Uh, the fact that um, Stasek was the member of the team that created uh, the core exhibition at uh, the Pauline Museum, Museum of the History of uh, Polish Jews in Warsaw. Uh, of course, I would not be able to present all the articles and books written by uh, Professor Krajewski, um, but for the occasion of uh, our conversation today, I also prepared a book uh, to show the cover. So now we uh, present uh, um, both of our guests with the books as well. And this is the book, uh, Poland and the Jews, Reflection of a Polish Polish uh, Jew. Um, and I think um, the presentation of uh, this book uh, and it, it con its content um, is one of the reasons why we are hosting you today to talk about the Jewish life uh, in Poland post-1989. But um, before we start talking about post-1989, I would like to move back a little bit to the 1980s. And uh, my first question to you is to uh, give some description to um, uh, our audience uh, of the life as it was uh, before 1989, especially the formal situation and uh, the, um, the situation of, of Jews in Poland. How did it look like? What was happening then? Okay, so thank you for inviting us. Thank you all for being here with us. Of course, it's a large topic, so um, we should be very, very brief. 
uh, it was in the 80s, like in the previous decades, uh, we were in the situation of, uh, of the, where the rule was of the Communist Party that was, you know, uh, controlling everything. Uh, so there was no freedom of speech or freedom of, of associations, which meant that it was hard in many ways for everybody, uh, including the, for Jewish life. Freedom uh, of publications, for example. No freedom of, yeah, difficult yes. to, and impossible to publish many things. And especially in, in, with respect to Jewish life and the Jewish topics, there was a taboo, a virtual taboo on Jewish topics since 90, after 1968, where the anti-Semitic campaign official, of, officially sponsored made most Polish Jews who remained in Poland emigrate forced them to emigrate, but the others have remained, but it was taboo. And also there were very few contacts with the, with the other countries, uh, of course with Israel especially, but not only. Contacts were difficult, publishing was difficult, associations were difficult, uh, private and private, you know, private life was not difficult and was, I mean, also difficult, but it was much more rewarding than otherwise because very little was happening in public. Of course, this is generally well known, but the main thing is that the, the, there was no possibility to create Jew, Jewish organizations as, the, as there was no possibility to create other organizations if they were not officially initiated. So in Jewish life, the official cultural social association of Jews in Poland was the most important organization, uh, controlling more or less everything. And it was uh, led by communists, people who were convinced communists or were just pretending they were communists. And, uh, and anything else was just a little tiny margin including religious life, which was really marginal, with no rabbis after 1968. And, uh, you know, mostly those who participated in the religious life of that time, the 70s and the 80s, were people who, you know, had some secular careers, but then they were either, you know, kicked uh, out of them or just you know, finished uh, with their careers and they came to the synagogue to be with pe people who were similar, similar to them, who had received their Jewish education before World War II. And some of them, some of them former colonels in the Polish army, for example, are also leading the, the, Jewish, the Jewish religious organization. But it was tiny and almost invisible and very few people of later generations were participating, almost nobody, actually. So this is generally the, the situation. And maybe we can show, in order to somehow to illustrate what it was, we can show something. We have this possibility of, of uh, I hope you can see it, Jewish life in Poland, and we have... Uh, yes. The this is um, a reminder of uh, of uh, well of what we um, experienced then uh, when we started traveling around Poland and uh, looking for traces of Jewish monuments, uh, some traces uh, of uh, you know I don't know doorposts with uh, mezuzah. Uh, that indicated that there had been mezuzot on them. And uh, this was really like a discovery and then it was uh, very difficult. And this synagogue uh, in Jaworszyce, the first time we saw it, it had a roof and it had paintings on it um, inside. Uh, then when we came for the second time, it was uh, already the roof had collapsed uh, so it was very, uh, well, telling experience that this is the fate of Jewish monuments in Poland. 
And at the end of the presentation, you'll see, uh, well, a continuation of this. This, were, this was <clears throat> uh, what the uh, Rema symmetry in Krakow looked like. And uh, the toy horse that's here, it wasn't uh, installed by us for the sake of a more interesting photography. So it was there, it was like garbage. And this um, uh, picture from a town near Warsaw, <clears throat> well, uh, is symbolic of the <clears throat> emptiness uh, of uh, Jewish life there. It's the like time. a desert, and of course, it just, it's, uh, you know, it's not very large, but it's a, 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 a sand heap. Sand, sand, um, heap. But, uh, and it well illustrates, you know, it's me, by the way, but you can see myself in many, many decades ago. So, so basically, you know, it's a grim picture, but the question is whether there was something that was good in some sense from, I mean, in terms of Jewish life. And I think some Jews of that time would say there, is, there was something good, namely, it was impossible for anybody to, to have, to organize, uh, you know, associations. It was impossible for the Jews, which is, was bad, but it was also impossible for the anti Semites to organize themselves and be more publicly visible. So, anti Semitism was present, but it was not present in the public area, in the, in, in the you know, not in publications. After the 16, 1968 was different, it was an exception, but later in the 80s, it was uh, taboo. So, also, anti Semitism was not very much displayed. Even though it was there, but how, how, to what extent, we didn't know really. And it was very hard to say because there was, everything was hidden. Everything was hidden, uh, including anti-Semitism. Now things became to change, to, to, be, to be different due to what? To, first of all, to this initial original uh, solidarity movement in 19, 1980 and 81. And this uh, was followed, as uh, we remember so well, uh, by the uh, uh, martial law period in 1982. Yeah. And then of course, everything was frozen, but during the solidarity period, many things became possible. The taboo was lifted. But uh, let me add that <clears throat> uh, on the night uh, the martial law was introduced, um, uh, well, a lot of our friends uh, were arrested, uh, sent to internment places. And uh, among them, also many Jews who were active in um, democratic opposition before that time. Mm -hmm. Of course, this was a disaster in many ways. Uh, but uh, the, mm -hmm. you know, it's important to say that a little bit later, uh, when the martial mm -hmm. law period was you know, a bit softer, the government, the communist government, who, which had introduced the martial law, tried to get some more legitimacy in the eyes of the West, Western countries. And they used the Jewish uh, factor, so to say. Or the, namely, they tried to show that they were good to the Jews, and that, that's why they were to be accepted. Uh, and one of those one of the results of that was, was the mm -hmm. reconstruction of the Nozick synagogue, which had been, be, had been uh, reconstructed for years and years, and mainly due to the money that came from, uh, from the joint from America. But, uh, uh, but then it was helped by the government so that in 1983, which was the 40th anniversary of, of the ghetto, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a, there was an official rededication with many Jewish visitors from Israel, America, and other countries visiting. But, many of whom were, were not aware or really um, uh, 
care less, didn't care about the general situation in Poland. At yes. The time. Or even if they were some of them, they still thought it was worth visiting and uh, you know seeing the synagogue rededicated and seeing you know some more possibilities for Jewish life. There, there were other events happening at that time, but it's important to say that we, that is we personally and our circle of friends connected with the solidarity movement, then underground and anti-government, anti-communist activities, we, we were not present there. So the, our boycott was uh, politically uh, motivated and it was uh, announced as such. And uh, in fact, we did some uh, unofficial commemoration, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, but the fact is that we did, that things did happen, did uh, move forward to some extent. So just to give another example, here is, you know, what was happening in Kazimierz Dolny or Kuzmir, uh, where the Matsevo, the tombstones were... During, during the war, they were used by the Nazis uh, to pave various uh, courtyards um, in, in the town. And it took years uh, for many organizations, small Jewish organizations, uh, including ourselves and conservators, uh, to negotiate the uh, returning of the tombstones to the Jewish cemetery. And nothing could be done for many, many years. And finally, uh, one of the, uh, well, of, active party members who, who was an architect uh, pushed this um, project forward and uh, it happened. The Matsavot were returned to the cemetery and a monument was uh, built from them. We were helping with uh, recognizing that the, uh, well, the, the tombstones, uh, how they should be placed in, in, in this wall. So this is why my husband and Jan Jagielski were present in the former picture. And, and the man, monument, which was um, later dedicated, really is, well, it's good that it happened. Yes, yes, it's a good monument. So it, uh, and it has remained, of course. Uh, so, uh, so it was used, so the Jewish theme was used for political purposes. I must say that all the opposition, anti-communist opposition of that time was also using the Jewish theme in some ways. Of course, we are very much connected to them and identified with them and worked together. But the fact is that they thought also that somehow the Jewish topics can be used for their benefit. And especially important was the very, very, you know, bright figure in Polish recent history, uh, Marek Edelman, who had been a leader of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and then one of the leader, leaders of that solidarity and the underground solidarity movement, etc. So in some ways, you know, the Jewish topics, despite the, the fact that so few Jews lived in Poland at that time, were important and used. Let me, and, let me uh, yes, you please for do. a second. Uh, you mentioned uh, all these uh, changes and the political uh, uh, political circumstances. Um, I would like to ask uh, about the forms of Jewish life because uh, there was uh, the official re religious congregation, but there were also new groups, even if not official, but they, in a sense, shaped the new generation of Polish Jews. And uh, you probably uh, can guess that I will mention the uh, uh, Jewish Flying University, uh, uh, which uh, you were part of. Uh, so if you could tell us about this new, um, new generation, new group, uh, that would be uh, interesting. And also the forms of Jewish life uh, that were um, created uh, by um, this new group. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Of course, our generation was uh, people born after the war uh, uh, with no wartime or 
let alone pre-war time experiences, you know, were already adult. We were already adult and we tried, some of us, some of us tried to get uh, more Jewish knowledge, to get some sort of, sort of Jewish involvement. The official organizations were not good enough for us. The synagogue was too traditional and not really open to our needs at all. And so we tried our ways. And this was just a small group of people, mostly in Warsaw, in Krakow, then in Wrocław, and you know, a group of friends. Uh, and we were, it was this flying university, a Polish tradition from much earlier, was, you know, called so because we were gathering in uh, pr private apartments from, from one, uh, then another, then another, still another one. It for seminars, for self-training seminars. And, and of course, we didn't uh, invite anybody on the phone because the phones were, at least some were bugged. And we were afraid, yes. And so, and so what, what this was the self seminar, but also we did some, for example, private unofficial commemorations in front of the ghetto money in Warsaw. Uh, a group of us, uh, mostly our age, but also some of our uh, parents, of people, parents, or the they, they age people, so uh, they're with us. But the main thing is that we wanted to learn more, and we are using, for example, the you know this uh, Jewish catalog, the American counterculture product. Jewish counterculture product, the Jewish catalog, a do-it-yourself kit. A do-it-yourself kit is just exactly what we needed. And we then, you know, were happy, we were fortunate enough to meet many of the authors who published there. And the whole style, you know, counterculture style is really something that was just perfect for us. And it was like a discovery for us because like an eye-opener because uh, really no literature on Jewish culture, uh, well, or tradition or how to cultivate Jewish tradition were av available in Poland. Mm, so uh, for us, those uh, friends who came from abroad uh, and uh, those who, who did come before it was such an easy uh, travel and easy traffic between Poland and America. Uh, they brought us books and they brought us their experience and that was really very important. So this is, for example, a celebration. Say that actually. This is Michael Steinlau here. For example, yes, yes. In the back. Right. So the um, visitors, especially from America at the time, were very, very important to us. This made it possible for us to not only to learn more, but to be, to connect to real or at least, you know, live Jewish activities. We also did go, it is a group of us we go coming to the Norwegian Synagogue for a celebration, one of those celebrations. It is the late 1980s, 1987 actually. And, uh, you know, already with, also with children. So that's, uh, was, that's how it was. It, um, I, I would like to mention also one more, one important uh, helpful uh, development, namely the Korczak Society. Janusz Korczak, the Polish pre-war educator, very, very remarkable a person and author, well known in Poland, in, I hope known to many of you. He, uh, there was a, an organization, Korczak Society, which was active both in Poland and in Israel and in other countries. And from Israelis, the Israeli Korczak Society visits in Poland in the 1980s were very important because this was the first contact with Israelis that was possible in Poland uh, because there was, there was no diplomatic ties for so it was very uh, otherwise it was very difficult. Of course, there were people from Poland who were visiting Israel sometimes, but uh, but it was uh, uh, difficult. One had to get you know the visa on a separate paper, you know, not in the passport, no, it was complicated. 
and always difficult to get abroad anyway. And another thing that was important and helpful to us was that, that there was a general, in our generation, there was a general interest in things Jewish, especially among Catholic intellectuals. And the, the more public activities were possible due to this initial solidarity movement in 1980-81, and some monthly and other published Jewish issues and some other publications appeared, and all those things became uh, help, very helpful to us. In addition, there were also Jewish studies, the beginning of the Jewish studies, still in the 1980s, academic studies, of, especially of Jewish, Jewish history in Warsaw, in Krakow, the, and there were also contacts of uh, scholars and in, still in the 1980s, and it was very important, but the most important breakthrough event was the Oxford Conference on the History of Jews in Poland, uh, organized by Professor Polonsky and by Rafael Scharf um, and others. And so some of the people who were so important in, in the 20th century history of Polish Jews were present there too, like um, Mr. Borwicz or, or Guzman or Schmerug or uh, Lichten from, from Rome, I mean, from the ADL and, and many others. So it was important for us because we were there too, we Monica and myself, so it was important to us. And finally, let's mention one other helpful uh, development if, if from the very late eight, 1980s. It was the visit of the Pope, the John Paul II, Here's the visit, and he was given Monica's book mentioned at the, the very beginning, the uh, uh, time of stones, and uh, and uh, yes, it was the first and last time he was looking into it. But anyway, and it was important because this visit and this meeting of the Pope with the Polish Jewish representatives uh, was you know, made us much more legitimate, much more respectable than ever before. So this made it easier for us when the political situation changed and it was possible to develop Jewish institutions to, you know, to be more visible and to have some more people with Jewish roots come and participate, although it was never easy, but this is, so, but this is so. This is basically how it was before 1989. So yes. The tone is We can't hear. Can't hear you at the time. Okay. Unmute my. Uh, yes. Okay. Now it's okay. So it's uh, it's time for me to interrupt. Um, uh, first of all, um, some technical comment. Uh, I think there is some uh, noise probably coming from uh, the electronic device that is next to your computer. I don't know if. Uh, People can hear it, but the, it causes some some. Or maybe uh, if you can move your your laptop a bit, maybe it will help. So when you speak, uh, there's some noise uh, coming, uh, and we want to make sure that the quality of the audio is good for our audience. Uh, is, uh, is it better now? It seems to be better. Um, so uh, try to pay attention. Uh, it seems like it's, uh, I do not, war, uh, do not know the word in, in English, but in Polish it's pięcie, uh, jakiś. Uh, because we don't hear anything here. We don't, it's, it's perfect, perfectly quiet here. It's, it's much better so, now. It's much better now. Good, good. Oh, I'm sorry. I okay. It will work now. So uh, now I can... Good. I can move uh, back to the questions. And uh, just um, as we are um, finishing to talk about the period before 1989, uh, there is another element that is worth mentioning, uh, which helped the transition. Uh, uh, and this is the presence, not just of um, uh, Jewish individuals in Poland who were supporting you uh, in uh, uh, self-development uh, in shaping uh, the, the uh, education and Jewish studies, as you mentioned, uh, who made you kind of visible 
Uh, I mean, besides a Jewish life, there was also a Jewish culture that was the interest of uh, non-Jewish audience. And as we mentioned Jewish studies, I would also add the first edition of Jewish uh, Culture Festival in Krakow, which was a turning point uh, when it comes uh, to the interest in Jewish history, Jewish uh, life. But there were also several Jewish organizations that supported um, both uh, organized Jewish life in Poland uh, and also individual Jews. Um, um, I don't know if you could uh, say a few words about that. Of course, so the main, main organization was the JDC, the Joint Distribution Committee, that has been active after World War II in Poland all the time, supporting, after the war, supporting the Polish Jewish institutions and individuals. Then, you know, occasionally it was um, uh, removed from Poland, it was banned, but then re, re um, admitted again and again. and. Uh, and so and the, but so that's one thing and very important and the other thing is that there was uh, this uh, louder foundation ronald s louder louder foundation that helped develop the jewish uh, life especially jewish religious life and the, it began its presence just before 1989 in 1988 so in this sense it's like the transition period but it started before. That's true, and it's extremely important. And uh, but it really developed later. And as you mentioned, the Jewish Krakow Festival, a local initiative from Krakow, absolutely local, uh, a, that started also in 1988, but developed in the 1990s. So all those little initiatives that you know developed about the 59, you know, and became so important were. Uh, belong really to the period after 1989, even though they they had started earlier. Now, this is the, this is the most important activity of the Lauder Foundation. I think the most important in terms of the impact, namely the, the summer and winter camps in Rygwald. And this is just an example of how it looked like. Mm. And it was very important, uh, this is a prayer. So it was mostly religious education, but not only, but also the social part of it was very important. Socializing, meeting people from all over Poland and um, uh, also coming from abroad. These are all Rygwald, uh, pictures from Rygwald from the early 1990s. And, uh, and so, so there, it was, it's very hard to overestimate its importance. Many of us have not only le learned there, but you know, understood there how that it was possible to be more Jewishly active and more Jewishly uh, involved, and uh, and how to do it. And every brown day, uh, well, a lot of our friends uh, uh, were there many times, uh, or year after year, and everybody now remembers those camps with. I with wet eyes. <laughs> yes. Uh, mm, and this is and the, it's important also to mention that there were later other other uh, foundations came to 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 assist the Jewish life in Poland uh, later. Also, especially I would may mention the Taube Taube, Taube Foundation uh, that has been very active until now. The other foundation is still active, but uh, there are others. And, but, and there are other individuals and groups that were uh, helping. And that uh, is, you know, a bit embarrassing, I would say. But the fact is that most of the new initiatives, new institutions, new, real, really new developments in Jewish life in Poland after 1989 uh, was possible due to the, not only assistance, but actually initiating it by, by our for friends from America mostly. You to, you just to mention some, uh, something that is so telling that the most Polish organization you can imagine, Jewish organization you can imagine, namely the, the Association of the Children of the Holocaust. That is the people who were 
are living Pol who live in Poland and were Jewish children during World War II, hiding in Poland one way or another. So this association was created in New York because you know there was a meeting of Holocaust survivors and some people from Poland went there and then they understood that they could form an organization, they did it. So even this was assisted in a, such a significant way by our American friends. Uh, and this is the case with almost everything in uh, post-1989 Jewish life developments, I would say. Now, one of institutionally, it was important that also there were schools and the preschool and then the school louder school and then other schools in Wrocław especially uh, were created in the 1990s. We were among the five families who started the um, uh, preschool, the Jewish kindergarten, and it was such a novelty because in fact uh, before the political change all kindergartens were state, so it was uh, uh, something unthinkable to start one's own uh, kindergarten and especially a Jewish one. So the, the picture to the left is from Purim, of course. Purim and the children in another picture. Ah, this is the, the, the school, the Loder school in mm -hmm. Poland with Helis the director and Mr. Loder. And as you see, Hillary Clinton visiting. And uh, and here is one of those camps. Uh, A continuation of, of the revolt camps uh, in recent years, but they stopped. And an interesting development that occurred then was that uh, some of the children that learned things in school became more knowledgeable than their parents and they were teaching the parents, which is so, you know, this was a, a new development too. Plus, uh, 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 of course, it's very important to remember that most Polish Jews, people who po Poles with Jewish roots, uh, have mixed parentage and many are uh, in mixed marriages. So all uh, this is very a very complex situation. So becoming more Jewish was, uh, was also difficult because of that but it was possible and the school was open to everybody and things have developed and they continue, they continue this way. Uh, but the most important change in post-1989 post period was the development of religious institutions. So in the Union of Jewish Communities, here you have the synagogue, the Nozick Synagogue, the one rededicated in 1983, with the children from the Jewish school present and the others listening. So this was like a, you know, symbol, this is a good symbol of the new situation. Children in the synagogue, from the children from the Jewish school. So, you know, things became very different. Most parents of those children uh, were for the first time in their lives in the synagogue because they came to watch uh, their children. That's it. That's how it worked. So there were rabbis, especially Michael Shudrich, who came as the representative of the Loder Foundation, and then in the in 2003 became the chief rabbi of Poland. Other rabbis, Rabbi Pash in Krakow. You know, in now I would say that uh, that this Jewish religious component is very visible. Of course, it's by far not the only one, or even for most people who identify, identify themselves as Jewish, it's not the most important part of it, but to everybody, it's an important presence that you know, one can have contact with or participate if one needs to, or etc. cetera. And, uh, uh, and here, yeah, here it's our son in, you know, it was this, the, the finishing of the Torah scroll writing in Lublin in the synagogue with the visit, yeshiva. In the yeshiva, former yeshiva now reconstructed re building and uh, with foreign visitors, of course. Uh, and uh, the important thing is that now we have also Orthodox uh, reform uh, and other communities and also Chabad. So 
so the variety and the multiplicity of Jewish religious life is present in Poland in full to the full extent as everywhere else. And there, there have been several Polish rabbis, uh, Polish-born rabbis, although I must say that the five of them, if, even if, I, if I'm, I'm from Orthodox to Reform, but only one of them, and she is a woman, Rabbi Ma Maugosia, Ma Maugosata Kordowicz is in Warsaw, others mm -hmm. are somewhere abroad. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, um, uh, of course, the Reform Synagogue, not Habal. Um, and uh, well, here's yes. the Rabbi uh, um, Stas Wojciechowicz, and uh, a woman who, who was uh, at the time the uh, director of the Warsaw the president of the, the president of the Warsaw Gehila. Here is, and here I see you see this the the the, the only Polish conservative female rabbi in Warsaw. Another Polish factor that I know is the next one. So this one is not all that was possible because of the. Nie słychać. Coś się stało. We had some terrible noise uh, coming from uh, your side, uh, so we couldn't hear the last uh, few seconds. Oh, that's, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And how, how is it now? What's happening? Now it's perfect. Now it's fine. It's, I, okay. uh, it's, it's the distance. So again, there are several Polish-born rabbis, Polish rabbis, but they are mostly abroad now. Now, uh, uh, it was possible due to the new atmosphere in general, but also it was important uh, important uh, in the in the more formal way was that the, in the 1997 there was this new law, Polish law, uh, adopted by the Polish Parliament, that made the Jewish communities, religious communities, uh, uh, the heirs of the pre-war Jewish communities, and it was connected with the restitution uh, law, which made possible a partial restitution of the former Jewish community property to the present day Jewish communities. It's been a long process that has been going on, uh, but it made, uh, you know, due to its abilities and other plots, uh, uh, were uh, restituted and and this made it possible the, also to have some local funding for various projects and activities and so it's in this sense it was extremely important and the and the former cultural uh, social association is still an important Jewish organization but by far not the only one and several new organizations were created new completely new and like the i mentioned the children of the holocaust the jewish combatants youth organizations non-orthodox and you know recent more recently the bnei brit lodge but uh, the most perhaps important the most unlively uh, and the most in, in innovative have been the jewish community centers created first in krakow and then in Warsaw, JCCs. Mm -hmm. So you have the the Warsaw one with the Warsaw, you know, coat of arms, so to say, with with the Star of David. And it's interesting that uh, we all uh, we had thought already many times that well, all of those who wanted to become Jewish or join any Jewish organizations. Uh, have already done so. So will the new organization be, be um, interesting for anybody? And But it uh, turned out that new organizations attracted new people. Uh, sometimes they come and go, um, uh, so the numbers are un uh, uh, unstable, but uh, it shows that there's always possibility to attract uh, new people. So, this is uh, the, the event of the of the Shalom Foundation from Warsaw. Yes, which uh, Shalom Foundation also 
uh, runs interesting educational programs, uh, organizes the uh, singer festival in Warsaw. And uh, this is um, a group of uh, students of um, university for senior citizens. Uh, so I have a question uh, about uh, this new initiatives. Uh, you mentioned several organizations, religious, non-religious. Uh, we could add also the Association uh, of Social Cultural um, uh, Community or uh, the TES Kajet. Um, uh, and uh, uh, who were the leaders of uh, Jewish life? Uh, what were uh, what was the process of uh, um, establishing the leadership of the community? Where the leaders come from? Were they uh, as the rabbis uh, mostly from abroad or um, educated in Poland, uh, uh, selected from the community? Uh, what was the process of uh, um, creating leadership of the community? That's a very interesting process. Of course, the rabbis were all imported, but, but the leaders are, as you know, not just rabbis, there are many other ones. So in the beginning, in the early 1990s, almost all of the leaders were the rather elderly, relatively elderly people who had been uh, leaders before. The transition was rather slow. Uh, with the 1997 new law on the Jewish communities, also it was possible to have elections and uh, my generation, our generation, also came to be uh, uh, active, active, actively present. And here is the, um, the first or rather zero issue of the Midrash magazine with Jerzy Kichler uh, in front of the then ruin, still ruined at that time at that time um, uh, synagogue uh, white stork synagogue in Wrocław, uh, who became the head of the union of the Jewish communities the religious communities the, which was becoming the most important organization also because of the restitution process but not only also because of the of the uh, energy of those people who were active and he had been you know, active in those underground initiatives before in the 1980s in Krakow, then in Wrocław. So this is just an example. And in other important example is that the, when the new generation was slowly taking over, slowly, but of course it was inevitable, the uh, completely new people came. So, and there was the, the first uh, uh, woman who became the head of the Jewish community, the local Jewish community, the Warsaw one, Helena Datner, in the um, turn of the 90s and the 2000s, uh, and, uh, and some others who became, you know, uh, how, to, uh, how to summarize that, you know, the my generation and then the next generation. And, you know, the later, the more assimilated was the background of those new leaders. And you can see it also even looking at the names. All of the new ones, or most of the new ones have Polish sounding last names. Uh, and by the former ones had uh, typically Jewish sounding names, for example. But, uh, but of course, this is the process that, that is going on. Uh, um, what can I say more? You know, the, there was this, uh, you know, under communists in the, still in the 1980s, the head of the Teskajet, Mr. Shurmi, a theater director and the, the, direct, and the, the head of the th Jewish theater, was like the strong man who was basically controlling everything Jewish. But then it became, uh, you know, much more pluralistic. And, uh, and this has remained so. Um, mm, I'd like to add some, yes. Now we have, this is just an example of a monthly, um, unfortunately Midrash has not been appearing anymore, uh, but Hidush is another very interesting uh, monthly 
that is appearing in Wrocław and published in Wrocław very, and, very, and, and a, a very good one. And there are authors, Hezisia, Dni Książki Żydowskiej, the days of Jewish book, of the Jewish book and with us and Konstanty Gebert, a well-known um, figure in our, and a well-known Polish journalist. And writer. And writer. I'm sorry so many uh, photographs show us, but simply, uh, well, we had those photographs because they were in our This collection. has been already shown. Yes. Yes. The, the most important thing is that happened, a new idea is Limud. As you know, Limud was a new invention, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago. And it has come to us also, and it's been very successful, I must say. And, uh, you know, hundreds of people gathering together for a few days. Unfortunately, uh, it stopped. It stopped, but it will be, I hope, resumed soon. But now with the pandemics, of course, everything uh, is even more difficult than, than it used to be. So Limbut is something that must be mentioned. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'd like to yeah. add uh, just uh, um, a word about Limud, uh, especially for the people who uh, haven't experienced uh, Limud. This is the idea of uh, uh, educational event that was uh, created in Great Britain. Then it uh, was moved to uh, various parts of the world. But in Poland, it had a very special meaning because I believe it was one of the first gathering uh, um, during which uh, Jews from all around Poland could get uh, together and just to know each other. And this was uh, like the first meeting of uh, people who experienced the same, like uh, um, surprising, uh, surprisingly vivid Jewish life. Uh, and could share experience, could learn from each other. And uh, this uh, uh, project of Limut really um, uh, was uh, getting people closer and uh, formed the community also on all Polish uh, level. So right. um, in this sense, it was, it was uh, quite important and it's an amazing atmosphere as uh, you both uh, experienced and you you could sh uh, show us with the photographs uh, here um, that's right by the way this is miriam gonczarska who is the de facto orthodox rabbi woman rabbi but she lives in new york now and now we have several pictures to show like the rite of the passage rites of passage uh, <laughs> from Jewish life yes. in Poland, but I don't know. This should we should do very quickly. Very I think. Quickly, Monica, yes. you, you, you do it. You are the expert. Uh, Simchat Bat, uh, uh, naming naming of the uh, girl, uh, our uh, friend's daughter. By Rabbi Shudrik. By Rabbi Shudrik. Uh, this was our uh, younger son's bar mitzvah, which was probably the. Uh, first bar mitzvah of a Down syndrome per, uh, uh, boy in Poland ever. This was a bat mitzvah of our friend's daughter in Kraków uh, during Havdala. Uh, weddings uh, with, um, uh, well, in a modern way with the exchange of um, uh, rings by both sides. Uh, our wedding, which was far from typical, because uh, according to our uh, our lifelong interests, it was at the top of a mountain uh, with a lot of friends present. I mean, our civil wedding had been years before, but the, it was relatively recent uh, Jewish wedding. Um, if, uh, Jewish festivals, uh, well, it's interesting because many people who come to join us for Jewish festivals um, are those who don't uh, uh, organize anything, any Jewish holidays uh, themselves at home. Uh, so sometimes there's, there's a long waiting list. And this is typical of, of the style of life of many Jews in Poland, that yes, they would join, but they are not organizing things themselves. Um, uh, uh, this is a sukkah at the Lauder Marasha school. Uh, and uh, well, Purim. Uh, 
now Staszek, yes, want to... Yes. We have to touch on the issue of emigration as well. That's right. So this is just an example of our, our visitors from Israel, as you can imagine, as you, as you see. Because contacts with Israel has become very important and increasingly important to Polish Jews. Some have emigrated, of course, but uh, others do, have not. Uh, and some people from Israel have come or from uh, some emigrants even have come back, although this is rather rare, I admit. Uh, the visitors are, you know, all, all sorts of visitors come. Or, the groups of uh, Tzadikim come to of the... Hasidim. Of Hasidim. Come to, Hasidim. to see the Hasidim. Hasidim. Tzadik. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, to the uh, Ochel of the Tzadik. Um, uh, so so there are vis many visitors. Mm -hmm. Poland is very important for to, to Jews mm -hmm. uh, because of the, of the history. Uh, and... Uh, and uh, so it's so in a way the Polish Jewish presence is more important despite the small numbers uh, to the worldwide Jewish life I would say than it uh, is in many other countries with a similar size Jewish uh, community. But let me add that uh, some uh, visitor, visitors um, interact with uh, Poles or with Polish Jews um, uh, but some come only to see Jewish places, either the tombs of the uh, tzaddikim or uh, to the uh, to the places of martyrdom, of the connected with the Holocaust. Uh, have you? This is from Jerusalem. Yes, just just to mention that many people, many Polish have, of course, not only visited Israel but also mm -hmm. have gone to study in Israel for the special courses like Bancher and other courses. The, and Yakar is a religious uh, study, is a, a annual session, etc. So, so in this sense, the, it's really has, it's, it's important, an important uh, source of, 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 of Jewishness is our, our contacts with Israel. And of course, there are not, very many Polish Jews, as you know, how many is probably a question that everybody asks, and there is no good answer. It depends on whom you count, whom you wouldn't. But there are several thousand people who are members of the Jewish institutions, and probably you know uh, two or three times more of those who could have become because of their Jewish roots if they wanted to. But but an important also element is that now there, there are Ukrainian Jews. There, are, there is more than a million Ukrainians coming to Poland, more or less like Mexicans come to the United States mm -hmm. and to work. And some of them are Jewish and some of them are also coming to the Jewish institutions. So it's a, a new development, more or less, how much it will be, uh, be very, uh, how much the impact will be, it's not, it's unclear yet. So, and now there is something that we want to really very much to say, and I hope Adeta you agree, that there are all those events that are not part of Jewish life, strictly speaking, but they have been extremely important and instrumental in making yes. our Jewish life and institutions more um, alive and more poss and possible. And the most already mentioned the Jewish culture festival in Krakow is For certainly us. the For most us. important <laughs> one. For us, and I think, uh, yes. objectively. No, so. for us, uh, this is uh, like something that we really cannot miss. But a lot of people um, that have uh, passed uh, through the experience of this uh, festival uh, over the years, um, if, for them, it was also something uh, that. Uh, started they, their way of uh, discovering Jewish culture. And this can be said both about non-Jewish Poles and, and about Jews. So this is the culture, the big event, you know. The... Flash mob in, in the, in the uh, so to say, iconic Polish place at the market. Mm -hmm. Uh, place of Krakow. Margaret Square of, in Krakow. Uh, this was a very unusual event that was done during the festival. You know, there are Hasid, real Hasidim, not actors, 
uh, you know, singing the Shabbat songs on the stage, of course, not on Shabbat. So it was a very unusual. And here it's another Warsaw festival, very important too, because it has become very uh, big. And it's uh, with Daniel Kahn, an American uh, living. living in Berlin, who is a great singer, singing also in Yiddish. He has come and and there are several, there are at least two, you know, annual Jewish film festivals. So all those things are very important and make it easier to have Jewish life and also make it easier to become more Jewishly uh, active, which is very important. It's still not so easy for many people. Also the fact that we are, this is the Polish Council of Christians and Jews uh, commemoration and uh, so in with, this, with representatives of uh, different uh, Christian denominations, uh, yes. yes, right, right. Also here, and so there are also academic achievements uh, which are important. Uh, some of the Polish academic uh, Jewish studies are the most among the most important in the world. For example, the Holocaust studies done in Warsaw. And especially, for example, the, the Vasha and Gelkin and Jacek Lochak book about Warsaw, the Warsaw Ghetto, or Marcin Wojcicki about Hasidim uh, are very important. Or the Ringel Bloom archive published by the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. All those things also make it make, are important for Jewish life, although they do belong to the academic life rather than Jewish life, obviously and are done by people who are either Jewish or non-Jewish. Here are commemorations, very important in Poland because Poland was the stage of the Holocaust. So the, all those commemorations are so important with Marek Edelman, one of the last years of his life. He was not very well, but he was always there. This is an important monument in Kielce, the menorah. Yeah. Uh, yes, and this is the Monument still also in Kelsey, the monument to the victims of the pogrom in 1946. A remarkable monument. You can see it, you know, on, on the right hand side, uh, and uh, it's unveiling or one of the uh, yes, a few years ago. Let me add that um, uh, the commemorations um, uh, of the Kelsey pogrom uh, started uh, many many years uh, earlier. Uh, but all by an inspired individual, non-Jewish, Bogdan Białek, and with, uh, he invited just privately a couple of people, and you were at the first March, how many? And there were four or five of us, yes. Yes, and later, uh, many years later, already in the different era in Poland, Mm, uh, there was the participation of uh, city officials and a big crowd of people. Uh, so the situation changed very much, uh, at least for some for, people. For the better. For the better, for mm. some Of course, people. now in recent years there, we have, we have, we have been witnessing the, the change for the worse, but that's another matter. But the, although all those institutions are active and present, fortunately, this is the Yedwabne monument, you know, where the, there was this massacre of Jews by their neighbors in 1941. Now uh, it's a monument in the local, local in a local uh, cemetery where the local priest was helping to, to renovate the, the, the monument, to make him uh, renovate the cemetery to make a monument. Yes, yes in to, to renovate the cemetery. And now the official words. attitude, yes, sorry. So I will add a few words before you move on um, about the initiatives, like the one in Kielce, the site of uh, Kielce pogrom in 19, uh, 46. Uh, there are other places uh, in Poland where the uh, initiative to commemorate the events, uh, to commemorate the Jewish community, to commemorate the uh, sites of Jewish heritage comes from the local people, from individuals, from institutions, from uh, 
activists, grassroots organizations, from educators, some, uh, in some cases, the schools. And uh, in many cases, uh, the Jewish community is being approached to support, to consult, just to be present uh, when the event like this, the, the one that you described, is happening. It's important that uh, you commemorate together uh, and such commemorations uh, happen to be the most, um, I would say, emotionally successful because there is an opportunity to meet, uh, the opportunity to, for the dialogue, and that's quite important. Absolutely and, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, so uh, just one more uh, word about the, the dialogue and communication. All the events uh, that uh, celebrate Jewish culture also uh, helped in some way to acknowledge the fact that there is growing Jewish community and they shaped some uh, atmosphere in Poland where the non-Jews knew a little bit more about the Jews when uh, the uh, sort of popular image of the Jews was uh, no longer uh, based on stereotypes, but it was more and more based on knowledge and some, um, you know, more, um, I would say, scholarly um, based uh, uh, description of the history and uh, all these initiatives that you so nicely presented here, so eloquently described, helped Jewish life in some way. Absolutely. And also, also it's important to mention the forum of dialogue, for example, and they and, and you know immense you know impact by assisting various local small local school groups in small places, small towns, in even in villages uh, to um, research the local Jewish history of the town of the place and to present it to other students and to the, uh, to the parents. And this uh, has been going on for years. And there are many other such, you know, all uh, um, Poland initiatives are done by some organizations, for example, competitions of, of student, uh, university student papers on Jewish history and, also, and little festivals that try usually you know, with no full success, of course, but we should try to co to imitate the, the, the Krakow or Warsaw uh, festivals. And so happening. And this is an important thing is happening. Uh, yes, let me add that this is really mm, a significant change because at the time when we were starting our mm, uh, search of Jewish traces in various places, we would meet um, individuals uh, in many places who were interested in the Jewish culture, had absolutely no access to any information um, uh, for us. Uh, well, we were at the stage of uh, learning our uh, tombstone Hebrew, that is, <laughs> we could decipher the simplest epitaphs. Uh, and for them, we were people who were already, you know, uh, had great knowledge of Hebrew. Uh, and um, uh, now there are uh, so there are such groups of people organized, uh, not individuals, in many, many places. Sometimes they had to uh, face a lot of, uh, well, uh, uh, unpleasant uh, confrontation with their surroundings, uh, with their neighbors. Uh, uh, well, maybe just uh, some atmosphere or, or of distance, so to say distancing from their activities, but now I think it's less and less so. And um, it was so moving to see hundreds of uh, school children at those events organized by the uh, Forum of, uh, for Dialogue. Um, and some of them were awarded uh, and they were really, really, there were big celebrations. Uh, it was something very... Yes, and now the what is the government's attitude and how, is it helpful? Basically the government, all the governments are 
uh, you know, want to see their Jewish life uh, develop. Uh, this is the an example, you know, the former president uh, Komorowski receiving from the leaders of the community, Piotr Kaduczyk and uh, Rabbi Shudrich, receiving a paper cut made by Monica, by the way. So, <laughs> but so, it was the uh, candle lighting uh, um, uh, of Hanukkah candles. Yeah. So in the, in the in days, yes, in the, the presidential in the presidential uh, head pa pa palace, palace, there was there was yes. this Hanukkah uh, mm -hmm. um, lighting of Hanukkah candles. So that's so, such things happen, and they continue to happen. Although now the present day government is rather trying also to have the extreme right wing uh, or behind them. So they are, they have those double attitude. They try to be, you know, nice to Jews and nice to anti-Semites at the same time, which, which makes it harder for us, but, uh, but, but they do both, by the way. So uh, now, uh, and the last thing that we want to mention are the museums and the Pauline Museum in Warsaw is the most important example of the of this new uh, presence in the public arena that has uh, changed the Jewish life uh, for the better because the visibility of Jews and Jewish topics is even higher now because due to those museums. Uh, so this is the Pauline Museum that you can see the ghetto monument from its entrance and the and the mezuzah made from a brick uh, found uh, in in the former uh, well in the ghetto ruins and this is this synagogue uh, painting of of the uh, uh, reconstructed synagogue uh, of uh, from Gwoździec. an important landmark in the museum and this is how it looks like for those who haven't been here yet but but the fact is that uh, you know the, at the same, very beginning, let me mention, there were some, uh, the, the feelings were rather unclear among the, the Jewish leaders in Poland, because they were afraid that the museum and the government uh, you know, support of the museum uh, would mean that the Jewish communities would be less supported. Uh, for example, other needs for restoration of buildings or reconstructions would not or get st state funds because mm -hmm. uh, the government would say, oh, well, we have given money to the museum. Uh, we support the museum, so we don't, we have done our, you know, obligations to the Jews this way. But in, but fortunately, I don't think that had this, those fears have, have, uh, have been uh, confirmed. I don't think so. The, the, you know, there are always problems with money and finances, of course, but it's not, a serious problem at the time. And there are others, uh, other museums, and of course the Galicia, Galicia Museum is the, is the, another very important, uh, our host here, hosting oh, us, oh, is the, our, our most important, one of the most important examples. And it was created by an individual whom you see, Chris Schwartz, who, uh, you know, who just did it, just by himself. It was just unbelievable with no support of anybody. And that's, uh, that's how it, get, it started. And uh, there are events happening in the museum as, as we know in Galicia Museum and we really do appreciate how important they are for Polish life, Polish culture and the Jewish life in Poland in particular. Yes. Um, uh, this is an example of one of those initiatives that honor those who uh, sometimes in small places um, uh, started taking care of Jewish uh, historical monuments or traces, in, uh, traces or, or um, in some other way uh, initiated, uh, let's say, some... some uh, educational uh, initiatives um, and this is one of those events and uh, this girl is being awarded. 
So I will add that the, uh, the gentleman on the right is Michael Trison, who uh, started uh, the whole initiative to recognize uh, the Poles who are taking care of Jewish heritage, uh, who commemorate the uh, Jewish past and Jewish presence in Poland. And uh, this uh, uh, initiative has been uh, happening for many years now. And uh, many people who are really crucial for local uh, activities, uh, for local initiatives have been uh, uh, recognized. Um, is, as, you're, as you're moving to the next photo. Um, this we is the, have last, a... the last one, by the way, we wanted to show because this is how the synagogue in Jawoszyce, remember they are very first Photograph was the ruin of a synagogue, and now it, this is how it looks like That's now. Perfect, because we have a question from the audience, uh, from uh, David Schwartz, asking uh, about what happened uh, with the synagogue uh, in Jawoszczyce. Uh, it's his father's hometown, so he was interested in the state, and without knowing this question, you prepared the presentation in the way to answer That's it. Right. To <laughs> because I think um, these two uh, photographs combined are symbolic uh, because they show how much was um, still uh, there to be saved and because of the many years of neglect uh, and uh, poverty uh, under communism and uh, taboos and so on, how uh, how much was lost and now it's a, it's a, so to say a preserved ruin. Uh, the first time we were there, we were um, accompanied by a group of drunkards who were uh, drinking in the bushes uh, near the synagogue and there was nobody else who would be in here with uh, uh, Ruth uh, Gruber who, who organized um, a tour of uh, Jewish historical monuments and a, historical, uh, and, and a conference of um, um, Jewish Heritage uh, Europe organization. Um, uh, we were accompanied by the officials from the town and it was with big pomp and so on, but how much was lost? Um, so this is uh, the town of uh, Jawoszyce that also embraced uh, the follow-up of the movie made by American Jewish filmmaker uh, Menachem Daum and uh, another filmmaker Oren Rudavsky, Hiding and Seeking, which was at some point um, the film that initiated the discussion about uh, uh, relations between uh, Polish Christians and Jews during the Holocaust. Uh, and today, the town of Jawoszyce is also facing some activists that grew up in this town that joined the, uh, one of the schools for uh, run or supported by the Forum for Dialogue. And they educate local people. And uh, the local um, municipality is aware of us, uh, the rich Jewish history and the fact that uh, the history should be preserved in some way because it's one of the treasures of this town and it's part of its history. So without it, it's uh, like losing the identity in, in some way. Uh, we have another question and if you allow, I will uh, move slowly to the end of our meeting because uh, uh, we've been on uh, line for already almost 90 minutes, uh, but there's one more question uh, from the audience which um, is related to the museums uh, and to Warsaw. Um, uh, so you have the experience with Pauline Museum uh, of uh, the history of Polish Jews. Um, there's a question about the establishment of the Museum of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And um, would you like to say a few words on that, not getting into too many details? Well, uh, so, uh... The, the new museum is being uh, created and the question is whether it is uh, it was necessary but of course another museum could be a very valuable presence the fear of many people you know 
who are dealing with museums was that it would be created with the support of the government in order somehow to uh, get the government control over the presentation of the of the World War II time uh, situation uh, and uh, relations between Jews and and the Polish public at that time. And uh, but so far, it's very hard to say what will happen. Maybe it will be a very valuable, valuable, valuable development mm -hmm. uh, museum. Uh, okay. we, we, it remains it remains to be seen. One of the big problem is that you know we have both in the Pauline we have a wonderful um, a, a presentation of World War II of the Holocaust, and we have another. Uh, 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 museum, the Jewish Orientation, you know, with Ergel, Ringelbaum archives can be used without, uh, you know, making, uh, uh, taking them away from the two existing museums. But if this is resolved in a successful way, it could be a very valuable addition to the to the museums. But if not, that there, there could be some some tensions that that could be unpleasant but you know it's 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 in, i would i don't know what will happen we will we'll see we'll see absolutely we'll see soon uh, how the uh, coexistence of of the museums in warsaw will be um happening or not uh but uh definitely it's another initiative and it's it just shows the diversity of the museum and the approaches to what should be shown and um, what ideas behind the museums uh, are existing. And for those of uh, uh, our participants who haven't been to Poland, I would just add that uh, the Jewish um, history and the Jewish heritage in Poland is being presented in the museums run by the Jewish community, co-run by the Jewish community, by state and private museums. And uh, this new um, museum devoted to Ghetto in Warsaw is uh, mostly by uh, the current uh, government uh, and um, in some cooperation with uh, the representatives of uh, Jewish society. So um, uh, there are a few more uh, comments and questions, uh, but uh, we do not have time to discuss them all. Uh, I think the question about uh, March 68 has to be left for another discussion uh, because it's the topic that uh, we can um, talk for a long time uh, here. I'm very grateful for all your stories, all, all your comments and your uh, participation in today's events. Uh, and uh, I we couldn't imagine uh, the better um, witnesses, not just speakers who talk about the past, but witnesses and participants of the events that you described. Uh, one of uh, uh, the key couple uh, that shaped, um, developed and uh, run Jewish uh, uh, life in Warsaw. There are many more questions that I have about uh, the changes in your family life, in your private life and the private life of other Jews how the evolution happened after 1989. But I guess we have to leave it for another occasion. And uh, uh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to see you. Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you, uh, thank thank you. you everyone in the audience for joining us uh, today. Um, it's been a pleasure to host you all. And thank you, uh, um, a big thanks to Tomek who was, uh, uh, the organizer of the whole panel and Galicia Jewish Museum as uh, the hosting institution. Um, thank, you, thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and, and for, Mr. yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kreski, it was really a pleasure to uh, get behind the scene of the events that we know from the historical books of some of it and see it from your 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 perspective and um, i really i'm glad that you there were so many of your private photographs being shown in this uh, in this in this presentation thank you edita thank you edita for uh, uh, leading this conversation 
um, everyone stay tuned. We will be announcing next uh, next uh, uh, meetings, next events very, very soon. I think uh, Monica and Stasek wanted to say a few words at the end. Mm -hmm. Just thank you very much. And you know, the, the, the photographs uh, from our archives were put together by Monica. And we are really, you know, we would be happy to, to, to tell more. March 68, of course, is a great topic and very important, but it does not belong to 19, post-1989. But March 68 was the turning point to all of, for all of us. That's true. Thank you very much for inviting us and to, to you, Edita, for being the, the host. And, and uh, also, thanks for the questions. Uh, it's a pity we couldn't answer more yes. of more, them more. We'll have a look at them all. Mm -hmm. I've learned from um, my Hasidic friends that they have the rule always leave, to leave something for the next time. So we are leaving the uh, remaining questions Absolutely. for the next time. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Till next time. Till next time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.